Timothy. I might start off by just going briefly to the Smith New Court case, which I have not taken your lordship to. Mr. Lewis did, and you'll recall that it's cited at some length in Mr. Justice Calvert's judgment. And yes. that is in the authorities bundle tab four. And if I could ask you to go to the Passages that starts on the bottom of the page 66 of the bundle. It's 266 of the report. Yes. So this is Lord Brown Wilkinson, and uh, I think this is the section that Mr. Lewis took you to yesterday. And I just want to take you through the, what is the basic principle that we say you should be applying in this case. It says, in sum, in my judgment, the following principles apply. In assessing the damages payable where the plaintiff has been induced by a fraudulent misrepresentation to buy property. So that is the situation in which we are concerned now, because we have bought the warehouse receipts. That's effectively uh -huh. uh, what we're doing. Defendants bound to make reparation for all the damage directly flowing from the transaction. And your lordship will be aware that the key debate before his lordship is below well, what does the transaction mean? And we say that this section here gives you the answer to that. Although such damage need not have been foreseeable, it must have been directly caused by the transaction. In assessing such damage, the plaintiff is entitled to recover by way of damages the full price paid by him, but he must give credit for any benefits which he has received as a result of the transaction. Now up to there, my lords, the transaction, the only transaction we're talking about is the purchase transaction that's been induced. And it's the, the benefits that are received as a result of entering that transaction for which he has to give credit, or the claimant has to give credit. And he says, as a general rule, the benefits received include the market value of the property acquired at the date of the acquisition. But such general rule is not to be inflexibly applied, where to do so would prevent him from obtaining full compensation for the wrong suffered. So the rule, the basic rule is market value at the time of acquisition, which in the case of the warehouse receipts in this case was nil, because they were forged. Uh, might that, the time of acquisition change? It might do, his lordship says here, but it, it because the rule is not inflexibly applied, but it's applied to benefit the victim, not the fraudster. And one can see that from his point five. I'll just ask your lordship just quickly to read that for yourselves. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, our position, my lords, is that just looking at that basic principle as applied, to the facts of this case, the contracts that are induced are the contracts with Come Harvest and Megawatt. That's the point I've already made to your lordships. It is not the contract <coughs> that is entered down the line between MCM and ANZ. We say that they are not induced by the fraud. And it may be I'm repeating a little bit of what I said yesterday, my lords, but I want to make sure I get my point home. <clears throat> no doubt, my lords, but for us being induced to enter into those underlying contracts, the ANZ subsales would not have been entered into. But that's MCM's own commercial decision to enter into those 
financing contracts. Could have entered do, do, into. Do, do, do we know which came first as a matter of contract? Um, in, in any given pair? It, the, uh, my, my understanding from quickly looking at the documents last night that you were provided with me was, is that the contract would be the first contract would be our contract with Come Harvest Megawell. Whether title would pass under that contract at this point. Well, I don't think we get out of there, that out of the documents that you you sent us. Well the, I, the evidence seemed to be that we were shown yesterday that the on receipt of the emailed copies, a contract was then placed by MCM with ANZ before going back and mm -hmm. pricing the contract with Come Harvest and Megawell. That, that was what the evidence appeared to be. It wasn't quite as clear as it might be, but that, that was the way I read what was said it, by Mr. Riley. It, the, the, I, I, don't, I don't want to make anything up on my feet because the answer is reasonably opaque. It wasn't something that we featured on in the trial no. in such detail, to be frank. There isn't, there isn't a factual finding by the judge on this. I don't believe so, no. It looks as though they were more or less simultaneous, prob yeah. probably within minutes of each other, but what, what the precise mechanism was for going firm in each case, um, both up and down the line, doesn't seem to be in evidence. Yeah. And, of course, what the um, those, all of those contracts arise out of the overarching agreements that were entered, at the, the master agreement. Which yes, but they're just the, frame, the, framework, framework for individual model, contracts. Yes, which yes. provides the underlying terms as well for the individual contracts. Um, but if, if suppose that the ANZ contracts did come first, how would that sit with your submission that those contracts weren't induced by the fraud? Well, my lord, I would still say that the the, the inducement, uh, it, we are induced to enter into our contracts with Come Harvest Megawork as a result of the misrepresentations. We arrange our finance. Now, whether it was through ANZ or if it was through an existing facility with a bank, which may have been pre-existing, cannot affect, I would submit, the way in which one analyzes the assessment of damages by reference to where we buy the property. So don't the PMA letters, which you required to be addressed to A and Z, um, almost themselves indicate that A and Z was induced by the fraud, of which the PMA letters were a component part, to enter into a contract with you? Well, my lord, that that um, that gives rise to a, a different issue about A and Z being induced to enter into contracts and potentially having a. Well, claim. you said you said the contract is induced is with your contract with Come Harvest, not the contract down the line with A and Z. But what I just suggested to you is that um, the contract down the line with A and Z is in fact induced by um, by the fraud. But a separate contract, my lord. Yes, but it's the same fraud. The, the fraud, as a matter of fact, causes ANZ to enter into a contract with you, and indeed causes you to enter into a contract with ANZ. If you hadn't been defrauded, you hadn't had the forged documents sent to you, you would <coughs> never have contracted with ANZ. So, it, well, it, it, as a matter of fact, the frauds did induce both the contract that you entered into with ANZ and the contract you entered into with COH and MW. That seems to me to be inescapable as a matter of fact. You have to say, but legally it doesn't matter. Which is what I say. Which is what you say. Yeah. I understand that. But I don't think you can say that as a matter of fact the fraud didn't cause you to enter into <coughs> with ANZ because well, it well, plainly did. <coughs> well, I, I would I'd phrase it more along the lines of the, the causation argument that um, Mr. Justice Calver refers to in his judgment where he says that the um, contracts between MCM and Come Harvest Megawell are they are in 
produced by the full on any deal. The contracts we enter into with the ANZ, ANZ up the line are occasioned by that fraud. I would, that's what my case is on that. But they're induced by the fraud in the sense that you have been deceived into thinking there is a genuine warehouse <coughs> receipt. And it's only because you've been induced into thinking there's a genuine warehouse receipt that you pass it on to ANZ and enter a contract with them. I mean, the, well, factually, that's, my, my, I, I think, I, I can't undeniable. The facts. I, can't, I, I mean, there's nothing I can say further than what I've said on no. that point. I take the point. Um, uh, but it, it doesn't, in my submission, alter the fact that when you are talking about a, a, an acquisition of property that's induced by fraud, you are looking at that transaction there is a separate transaction. It's, it's basically the learned judge's point below. Um, and we take it as being said quite clearly by his lordship, Lord Brown Wilkinson, in, in the Smith Newcourt case, that that is the way that your lordship should assess the loss in this case. It makes things very simple and straightforward. And it may well be there is another transaction which might give us a, a, an opportunity to claim consequential losses, or the, the point we discussed yesterday against ANZ, whether that works or not, um, doesn't really matter. And it might give rise to a separate claim by ANZ against the fraudsters in this case. But that case would be based on the transaction that they entered into with my clients, MCM, i.e. you induced us to enter into that transaction, and that's how you would then assess their loss. So what, what is their claim, ANZ's claim, against the fraudsters? Is it for their 291 million? They, that would, some, that, that's what I would... So the fraudsters are liable for 284 plus 291. Well, if, if, they re if they were to pay MCM on the back of the findings of the judge below and pay the 284, ANZ uh, would have to, uh, and we have reimbursed, because we would have to reimburse up, because ANZ has got a claim against us as well and would under the, the agreement. But what if you haven't? What, what, if, what if you're insolvent and you only pay a small dividend to ANZ? Or even if they choose not to sue you, leave aside any question of the settlement agreement. The party is entitled to choose between rights against different people. Suppose ANZ said, well, we may have a claim against MCM, but actually we're going to pursue it against the fraudsters. Well, that doesn't, shouldn't prevent me having my own claim to tip. That's a separate claim. Right. So the fraudsters are liable for 284 plus 291. Potentially. So if, stra if straits have plenty of money and are good enough to pay, to pay both these sums, I know they say they're not, um, but if they were, they have to shell out twice. <coughs> On your case. My Lord, that's th that is the consequence. Doesn't that suggest that Well, it would, my lord, it would also suggest something must be wrong if my claim against Straits was, for example, limited by reference to the ANZ agreement that we were looking at, uh, so that the fraudsters don't... You mean the settlement agreement? Yes, the settlement agreement. Well, at the moment, we're exploring it, as it were, with regards... Yeah, uh, but I'm, I'm just looking at, looking at other matters, such as if we are only recouping the delta figure from the fraudsters by reference to that and not the balance. Now, we don't know. The same point goes uh, to my Lord Justice Popperwell's point that we don't know. ANZ may not pursue the fraudsters, so they would walk away 
with the difference between the 284 and the Delta figure. Well, ANZ have a perfectly good claim for the balance. It's up to them whether they pursue it. Yes. Can we go back to the position absent a settlement agreement? As I understand your case, you have a claim of 284 million, and you can keep it. It's up to A and Z whether whether they sue you or not. But if they choose to sue the fraudsters, you can keep the two eighty four, and A and Z can keep the two nine one. If the transaction had been genuine, the profit you would have got from the deal overall was seven million. Now you've ended up with two hundred eighty four million. Is that right? Well. With all due respect, it would be highly unlikely that that would be the position, given uh, the fact that we have passed on forged warehouse receipts to ANZ. There has to be an element of reality about the situation, I would submit, that there's no way we would be entitled to keep all of that money without giving credit over to ANZ. So you would voluntarily give money over to ANZ? Even if well, it's just, or, my Lord, so the reality of the position is that there's, uh, ANZ would not just sit by and not pursue us for the monies that they had paid for us. If straights are good for the money, why wouldn't they? It might be more difficult to get money out of you than it was out of straights. It doesn't matter. Well, but, but in theory, your, your analysis means that both ANZ and you have independent claims for upwards of 280 million against the same defendant, and the same defendant can be made to pay twice. And I think you accept that that is the logical consequence of your argument. My Lord, I do. If I could take you to the OMV decision, please, which is at tab 7. taken to this by my learned friend and I think was shown the head note and some of the passages from Lord Justice Clark, Christopher Clark's decision. I wanted, if I may, to start at page 146 of the bundle, paragraph 33. I just pick it up at the paragraph 33. This is dealing with the got the heading the comparative yield approach on page 146. And it's a relevant paragraph I wanted to read. As to the second submission, Mr. Southern contends that the correct method of assessing Raffiron's damages falls to be determined as follows. The crude oil was purchased in order to be processed into refined products. The refineries did so unaware that the cargoes were blent. So in this situation, my lord, the position is, like our case, is that it's known that the goods being purchased are going to be sold on, and in this case, for refining. In doing so, they obtained a less valuable yield than the brands would have done if there had been no deceit Petex would have bought Iranian Heavy or GOSM, or similar, and refined it in the usual way. Its complaint is thus about the relative yields of the blends delivered compared with the yield that would have been derived from Iranian Heavy, and its damages should be assessed by reference to the difference. To do so would provide compensation for Petron's loss in carrying out the transactions contemplated and put it in the same position as it would have been in if it had bought the brands from another supplier. 
So, my lord, the, the, the reason I'm showing you that is that what the argument was there was that you should look at the broader picture for the relevant transaction. That's what was being said by Mr. Sutherland. And he goes on, the fact that Rapiram was not obliged to supply the cargo is subject to the claim to the refineries is not, Mr. Sutherland submits, relevant or at any rate not determinative. In fact, it did supply the crews in question to the refineries, and that was the purpose for which they had been bought. Like these warehouse receipts were bought to be financed up the line by A and Z. Nor is it relevant that the buyers paid more for the blends than they would have done if they had not if they'd known the truth. Relevant inquiry is the loss made by the buyer from acting on the deceit and not what it would have done or agreed if it had not been deceived. Dropping down to the last sentence of that paragraph, what it did was to send the blends for refining as usual, and its loss should be measured by the reduction in yield. And well, that was the point that was being argued in. OMV Petron by Mr. Southern, and that was the point that was uh, not followed by their lordships, and not accepted by their lordships, because what they did was to say, no, you don't look at the sub-sale position, you just look at the transaction in question by which the party bought the property concerned. And we can see that, my lords, if you look at paragraph 37 at the bottom of that page, where his lordship cites the New Court, the New Smith Court case, the Smith New Court case, beg your pardon, and then cites the principles and emphasizing the point in the middle at three, the transaction there, and at 138, uh, 38, if I can pick it up there on page 147. As is apparent from that summary, the basic measure of damages is the price paid less the benefits received as a result of the transaction, reciting what uh, Smith Newcourt tells us, which will in each case where property is acquired be or include its value at the date of acquisition. He goes on to say, in my view, that is, in this case, there is, in this case, no sufficient reason to take a different date and good reason not to do so. The purpose of the flexibility approach about the valuation date to which Lord Brown Wilkinson referred was to ensure the person duped should not suffer an injustice by failing to recover full compensation in the type of circumstances to which he referred. There is no need to adopt such an approach in order to relieve the fraudster from the general rule as to damages, especially if so it means the person defrauded ends up paying more than the cargo was worth at the time he bought it, which is what we did in this instance. So there's a, and he goes on to say, reiterate the policy reason, as Lord, Bra Lord Blackburn in the Livingston case, that when damage is done maliciously or with full knowledge that the person doing it was doing wrong, you would say that everything would be taken into view that would go most against the willful wrongdoer. And we pay that in aid in this case. You, you'd look at the transaction, we say, by reference to our transaction with Come Harvest and Megawell. You should not be looking at the broader transaction. And if I could pick it up at the top of page 148, please, in para, 30, uh, para 40, his Lordship says, the amount by which the price paid exceeded a price calculated on the basis on that basis constitutes the measure of the buyer's loss, representing, as it does, the amount that he is overpaid on account of the seller's deceit. That loss arose when, on account of the deceit, he acquired the property for which he had to overpay. In fact, if such be that afterwards none of the risks to which the discount related materialised cannot alter the fact that the buyer was induced to pay too much when he did so. <clears throat> um, and my lords, the same principle is reiterated at 43, para 43, where it's a Glencore's criticism of the assessment of the valuation approach, and his 
because Lordship doesn't accept that. And uh, second reason, acceptance of this line of argument would mean that Glencore recovered a price, the CF value of the components, which it would never have recovered if it had been honest. Ergo, the fraudsters would never have got the 284 million uh, from my clients if they had been honest. And paragraph 46, oh my lords, dropping down, after his lordship has referred to some of the contractual cases and the res inter alias act of principle as it is applied therein in Slater and Hoyle and the like, says, this is a controversy which I do not propose to resolve. For the purposes of a claim in deceit, I would not regard it as right to discard an assessment of the difference between the price and the lesser value of the date of acquisition of the property in favour of an assessment dependent in part on whether anything untoward transpired in the course of refining. I would also decline to ignore the distinction between Rafiron and its refinery subsidiaries on the ground that they are all organisations of the Romanian state particularly when Glencore did not pursue its request for disclosure of documents, etc. Now, my lords, the the, the, the point that we say comes through clearly on that uh, is that you do have to have regard to the fact of separate entities, separate transactions, if it potentially means that there is a, a potential for a claim over by ANZ against the fraudsters as well. Well, so be it. That is a function of entering into fraudulent conduct. It does not mean that uh, my clients should not be entitled, we say, with, with due respect, to its basic loss in this case, which it was induced, being induced to pay over. Its loss is what it paid over to the fraudster, the $284 million, and that is the right amount. Now, my lord, that is all I propose to say on that issue. Um, and I suspect I've gone over it in far too great a detail in any event. But I wanted now to move on to make some comments or observations on the settlement agreement, if I may. Uh -huh. And the um, the way in which I want to address this is uh, if if you are not with me first point, so that um, you're not just looking at the transaction as being the contract entered into between MCM and uh, Cam Harvest Megawell as being the relevant transaction. So you are <coughs> potentially looking at a broader picture, and the question then arises, well, is the settlement agreement, <coughs> as we call it, um, in mitigation of the loss, or is it something that arises independently as a commercial negotiation between ANZ and MCM, so as it should not be taken into account in the assessment uh, of the loss. And that is the point if I may just show you what his lordship concluded on that point in the appeal bundle at tab 8. <coughs> at para 602, page 208 of the bundle. This is dealing 
under the heading of causation, uh, under the what he termed the secondary case of straits, that the settlement agreement is mitigation of our loss, which you can see the heading at page 203, my lords. Uh, and he deals with the question under analysis, under his heading two, under causation. And you'll see it starts at paragraph 596. Um, Strait submits the settlement agreement cannot be construed as a collateral benefit because it did not arise independently of the circumstances <coughs> giving rise to the loss. I, the circumstances giving rise to the loss being us entering into those contracts with Come Harvest Mega Wealth, we would say. Now, his lordship then goes on to deal with some authorities on the issue of the test uh, of causation and for mitigation. And then at 602 was the point I wanted to to rely upon. He says, in the circumstances, I consider that MCM's decision to enter into the settlement agreements should be considered an independent transaction, whereby MCM took on risk which might have transpired to be, depending on the outcome of this litigation, either a good or bad bargain. Isn't there a prior question, though, which is that even if you regard the um, two contracts as effectively a package transaction, the question is whether the settlement agreement does, on its true analysis, avoid the loss. My Lord, yes, yes, it, 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 well, my Lord, I was, it, yes, there is that other question. I was just about to say there are two points which my learned friend has got to establish. Firstly, is the fact that the two transactions should be regarded as together. So you bring into play the settlement agreement in the first place. Um, secondly, well, you, you bring into play the contract between M MCM and ANZ. ANZ, my lord, I beg your pardon, yes. Yep, there's that other stage. Um, question then arises well, was that settlement agreement legally caused by or necessitated by the loss that we have suffered. That is the, um, the, the point I was just referring your logic to at Paris 62. There is also the point that my learned friends have to show that there is a benefit derived from that settlement agreement in the sense, I think, as your lordship was just saying, well, has it avoided the loss? <coughs> what is the benefit that accrues to my client as a result of entering into the settlement agreement? And both of those two questions, latter two questions, I suppose, it will involve us having to look at the settlement agreement. We have to characterize the settlement agreement. What is its nature? And also, what is it providing? ultimately. Um, and you will have, you would have well, I said yesterday that at trial, we accepted before the judge that if he was persuaded that the settlement agreement or the my learned friends overcome those first two hurdles of getting into the settlement agreement in the first place, that the figure of 200 million, uh, excuse me, the figure that may or the, the delta figure that might ap appear in, uh, in the settlement <coughs> might uh, be the appropriate alternative amount by which to gauge the loss. <coughs> now that was done at a time where knew what our primary case was, but at a time where we were not facing any claim at all to the fact that, well, this agreement wipes out your loss. And to be commercial about matters, the distinction between uh, the claim and the delta figure ultimately would make little odds at the end of the day. 
motion. Now, one can read through the settlement agreement, which I'm going to ask your Lordship to do with me now. And the question arises, well, is there, in truth, any benefit to my clients as a result of entering into this particular contract, which, as your Lordships have gleaned, is not a simple, straightforward agreement to settle a series of contracts or a liability that's said to arise under a series of contracts between two parties. It involves, um, certainly on our side, MCM and its parent company and likewise on the ANZ side. It goes way beyond just seeking to say, well, you are liable to us for X in these contracts. Um, yes, we agree to pay you Y in order to settle our claim. <coughs> it is concerned uh, to a large part about pursuing recoveries both through MCM and ANZ and how those recoveries are to be applied. And it also imposes considerable obligations on uh, EDFM, the parent company, with regard to the conduct of its brokerage business and maintaining the value of that brokerage business going forward. Now, towards the provision you have already been taken to certain of the provisions in this contract, and I don't propose to reiterate or go back over those provisions, but the basic theme of it is that, that clause 3.1, which you'll find, well, I'm looking at the confidential aid document, if your lordships have that to hand. Yes. Clause 3.1 is where we have the mutual releases provision. Uh, which you've already read, my lords. Clause 3.2a deals with the situation in the event of an event of default. The release in 3.1 in favour of the EDFM parties will, <coughs> will be revoked. And essentially, you would be back to square one. Clause 4, we move into the payment provision at 4.1a, which your lordships have seen. At 4.2. Sorry, can I just to identify what the, the reinstatement in 32A yep. occurs if there's a 171B or 171C event of default? 171C is insolvency. 171B is a breach of the warranty. A in Schedule 2, which has a long list of warranties, correct, my lord, including yes. in relation to the solvency of the brokerage companies and their accounts. And the yes, sure that's all right. yes, but the relevant warranty is to do with um, uh, all material facts relating to the recycle. But <coughs> and a release could cease to operate by reference to something that has absolutely nothing to do with this. Correct. Okay. Yes. Well, absolutely nothing to do with the 
sorry, did you say contacts? Th th these contracts. Yeah, these contracts. Yes, indeed. Mother. These repo contracts. Yes. Yeah. And uh, then there's the 171A, which is the failure to pay any amount payable under the agreement at place and at time in the currency that is payable. But that doesn't trigger the. No, you're right. Your lordship's right. The removal yeah. of the release, is it? No, it's B and C. was moving on to 4.2 A in particular it's the avoidance but, of doubt. But before we leave 3.2 what, what is your submission on 3.2 A what, what is what is the what is the relevance to our issues of the fact that in certain circumstances none of which presumably have yet happened Presumably, you don't expect any of it to happen. And you don't. It's not your intention that any of it should happen. But how does it affect the question we have to resolve? Well, the question is that it, it there's potential, hopefully not to be the case, but potential down the line for the releases which you see in clause three to be taken away, and the event of default payment. Um, is the acceleration um, if we get, well, we have to go to to see what it says at 17.2 but basically it would reopen the amount that would be due under the alleged liabilities under the contract with the ANZ so you'd be replacing the, the full 291 yes yeah. so it has the potential to do that by reference to matters as my learned Lord, Lord Justice Popwell said, matters which are completely extraneous to the contract in this case. Yes, but how does it affect what we have? Suppose you didn't have, and I mean, I appreciate, and you're going to show us, this is a much more complicated agreement than simply saying, we'll pay you Y pounds in settlement of your claim for X. But suppose you did have a contract which simply said, you say we owe you 291, we don't accept that. We will pay you 150. If we don't pay on the due date, in three years' time, the whole 291 will become due again. But what would be the effect if, if you were claiming damages on the back of that? The court surely would, would take a view as to how likely the contingency was to arise. Well, it, it would probably have to at, that st at the time of trial, yes. Yeah. Assuming we got to that stage. Okay. But do you say, do do you say that because this is not a uh, a straightforward release, it is a conditional release, and it's a release whose conditions depend upon matters that have been uh, in part completely unconnected with the circumstances of the current case? That is itself an indication that it is an independent agreement, which is not to be treated as uh, a simple agreement which is by way of mitigation of loss because it uh, seeks to uh, release and only seeks to release the liability which constitutes the loss, well, it, if you're wrong so far, in this my, case. My Lord, yes, I would say that, and it, well, because it is a conditional release. You pointed out earlier that um, the agreement includes obligations on the parent company about the way in which it will maintain the value of the brokerage yes. business, yes. which um, which obligations may have a value to ANZ in its overall dealings with uh, the EDNF man companies. Um, which may represent part of the reason
reason why what we're calling the delta figure is lower than 291 million. Well, my lord, the, 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 those obligations, which we'll have a look at in a moment, are going, they are themselves have nothing to do with the contract. The I, I take your lordship's point. Well, they, well, they, well, they, they may be, the they may be, they may be partly to ensure that when the time comes in the future, um, there is money there to pay the delta figure if there haven't been sufficient recoveries in the meanwhile. Um, but it may have a wider significance, it, it, which we don't really well, know much about. Well, we yeah, and we we haven't delved into that in terms of evidence. Okay. And I want going to move on to 4.2, if I may. Um, so it's, the heading is No ANZ Payment, page 7. For the avoidance of doubt, the satisfaction of the payment obligation under this agreement does not release the parties from any other obligations under the agreement, including those under 13.7. And um, I'm just going to take this slightly out of order and jump on to 13.7, if I may, which is pages 14 to 15. And this uh, touches on a point that my Lord, Lord Justice Nugis referred to yesterday. There are two elements to 13.7. This is dealing with the treatment of the EDFM recovery. So, for example, recoveries in these proceedings. And there are two um, timing points here. One is prior to the relevant time, which is the figure of the maturity date, and the other is on or following the relevant time. And the point um, Lord Justice Nugi made, my Lord, made yesterday, which I would endorse, is that under A, if we were successful at trial against Straits and Straits paid us as they are obliged to do then save for uh, the costs involved or taking the outstanding relevant costs off the figure that money would have to be paid over in total to ANZ That's the effect of little a. And little b is similar ill, but this is so this is after we have made a two hundred million pound payment. So we have made a payment to A and Z. Delta amount. Um, the position would be we retain the relevant costs again, but 50% of what we recover, assume again the 284 million, would have to go to ANZ. So that 142 million, by uh, my account, by arithmetic, if we recover the full 284, but obviously there'll be some costs of that. So that is, it is not just the case of the delta figure being paid to ANZ in those circumstances. Well, if you recovered the full 284 million. So if you were paid your judgment sum tomorrow, you'd take off your costs, you'd hand it all over to ANZ under 13.7a. And when the maturity date came, there wouldn't be anything for your parent to pay because um, the 284 million would exceed the delta figure. Under A? Yeah. Under B, I'm not 
under B. Under B, you'd only pay half of it. But. And and but your parent would then make that up to a delta figure if, if the delta figure was greater than 142 or whatever it was. No, the, well, the under B, um, on or following the Roman Cup, this is assuming the delta figure has been paid. Oh, yes, yes. So we've had that figure, A and Z. Yes. And this is additional. Lords, just going back, if I may, then to page seven, uh, clause seven. This is one of the provisions that impacts on the, the way in which EDFM group brokerage companies can do their business. Because it's a, without ANZ's prior written consent, no EDFM brokerage company shall during the term declare or make or pay any dividend, charge, fee or other distribution, etc., or reduce any of its share capital or catalyze, repay or otherwise distribute any amount outstanding. Now, I take my Lord's point about the fact, well, this may be linked to the delta figure or the arrangement, but we, we don't know, but these are, and 7.2, these are provisions which have nothing to do with the underlying contracts at all. And they are imposing obligations on our parent company. And at 7.2 over the page, there is EDFM, EDFM agreeing to indemnify ANZ as a result of any reduction that is made under 7.1. And then at clause 9.1, we move on to the recovery, what's headed the recovery clause, and the collective interest between the parties to this agreement. It's the collective interest of the parties to maximise the recovery of money in respect of the relevant loss from litigation recoveries which to the extent received will constitute recoveries and the parties shall act accordingly. Now this is at the root we would say of one of the main aspects of this agreement. It's, it's ANZ and MCM and their parent companies agree how best to obtain recoveries against the fraudsters. And you can see at clause 9.3, recovery against third parties by A and Z. And this is after various interlocutory applications in 9.2, and the duties in clause 11.1, and the subject to obtaining legal advice, the A and Z parties will use best endeavours to pursue recovery of the relevant loss from any relevant third party. And that's the A and Z recovery. And then, as I think you have already seen before, my lords, at clause 10, we have the recovery against the third parties by MCM. At 10.1, MCM will use best endeavours to pursue recovery of the relevant loss, including but not limited to recovery from the following. And there we see uh, certain of the individuals, that, or entities that became party to these proceedings. And then clause 11.1. So what clause 10 requires MCM to do is to use best endeavours to claim 291 million, not 284 million. Best endeavours to pursue recovery of the relevant loss. Which is defined loss. in recital B as the 291. Yes, it is my lord, yes. But if we can't recover the 291, we have to do the best, best endeavours to recover the 284. We weren't seeking 291 in these proceedings, were we? We weren't claiming 291. You, 
did plead well, uh, a claim for consequential loss, which you explained to us yesterday. We did. intended to include the extra seven million. We, but it, it did not, didn't but identify the two hundred and ninety million. No, and and you didn't pursue we any didn't claim know. for consequential loss at trial. No, we didn't. No. Thank you. <coughs> And on page 10, the duty under the duties of the parties, 111A, at all material times, no party will directly or indirectly take any step or action which prejudices either recovery actions or a potential recovery from a third party. Parties shall mutually assist each other. And then there's, my Lord, 11.2, a cost provision. which is also relevant, the EDFM parties shall promptly reimburse the A and Z parties for all costs and disbursements incurred and paid by the A and Z parties in respect to the A and Z litigation recoveries up to an initial aggregate amount of 14.5 million and with a total cap to be agreed between A and Z and the EDFM parties. So 14.5 million and counting. You didn't claim that. My Lord, we have not claimed that, no. Not as a separate claim. Well, not at all. Well, we haven't claimed it under the 284, and we haven't claimed it as a separate claim. Yeah. Well, that would only arise anyway if there were claims by A and Z parties against somebody, um, and if they asked you to reimburse their cost up to that sum. But Correct. I don't know whether that has happened. Uh, I'm not sure we've heard anything about that. There, there are ongoing proceedings, but not in this jurisdiction. And the, uh, excuse me. targets are identified in 9.3 A and B at the top of 9. PWS and anybody asserting a competing interest on the matter. I'm corrected from behind on the issue um, of the costs. The, there was a claim for legal expenses at, at trial, which is at paragraph 69.3 of our pleading. It's paragraph 10, page 283 of the appeal book. element did include the ANZ cost, because we gave further particulars. What, under 69.3? I believe so. Oh, yes. I think we've given disclosure of it. Whether we've dis I don't recall making a specific claim for those cost lines. So it doesn't find its way into the judgment? No. 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 I, that's why I It doesn't leap off the page, at any rate, that those legal expenses are actually somebody else's legal expenses, which you've reimbursed under a settlement agreement. No. <laughs> yes? Um, next provision, my lords, I just wanted to show you was the clawback provision at clause 12. Where is it? On page 11, if at any time following the relevant time the total A and Z receipts exceed the relevant loss, A and Z shall pay to EDFM an amount equal to the excess over at the relevant loss. Again, an issue between. Uh, then there's a covenant um, at clause 
Windows 13. Whereby BDFM agree not to take any action which would reduce the uh, brokerage business. And then at 13.2, we have the long uh, list of uh, matters agreed to by EDFM during the term. It shall procure that no EDFM brokerage company does all of those matters from A through to M. And 13.4, your Lordship can see that the um, EDFM agrees that during the term it shall procure that no group company will take any steps to, or allow any steps to be taken to wind up any brokerage company. And then there are undertakings under 13.3 from EDFM, again, in relation to the conduct of the brokerage business by the EDFM brokerage company. So again, th none of those matters are related to, in any way, to the underlying contract and the loss that, that we were induced to suffer as a result of the fraud in this case. And as I said before, we've already looked at 13.7, that's the treatment of the EDFM recoveries. 13.8 is the treatment of the ANZ recoveries. Can I just be sure before we leave 13.7? The structure of this makes it in your interest to recover before the relevant time, does it not? Because if you if you recover £100 before the relevant time, you pay the whole of it over to ANZ, but it then gets knocked off the delta figure when the relevant time appears, so you, you get pound for pound benefit. Whereas if you don't recover until after the relevant time, you pay the delta figure at the relevant time and then you still pay 50% over. So you only get 50% of the benefit. Yes, that's correct. So that incentivizes you to pursue your recoveries and actually get the cash in, if you can, before the relevant time. Thirteen point eight, as I was saying, deals with the ANZ recoveries, um, and we can see it a prior to the relevant time, ANZ shall retain the ANZ recovery, so it just retains it for its own benefit. On or following the relevant time, it can retain for its own account the recovery amount and equal to the lesser of, and applies such retained amount in full or partial repayment. Its unpaid ANZ costs. Pay EDFM an amount equal to the lesser of the outstanding costs, relevant costs, an amount equal to such ANZ recovery less the amount retained under 3B1, 3.8B1, plus 50% of the amount by which an amount equal to such ANZ recovery less, less the amount retained exceeds the outstanding relevant costs to EDFM pursuant to clause um, A above. And then three, retain for its own account from the recovery all amounts otherwise retained. So there are the, the two routes for ANZ to recoup from the litigations that <coughs> under 3738. And then we have the Lord's... Can it be summarised this way? Any recoveries by either party or the relevant time go to ANZ and diminish the amount of the delta amount. 
Anything recovered by either party after the relevant time, by which time the, the delta amount has been paid, gets split 50-50, with adjustment to ensure people get their costs. In, in rough terms, my dear. <coughs> um, my Lords, in, and I'll, I'll just give you the, the heading, uh, 13.9 is the non-circumvention provision, and then under 14, uh, ANZ is given the right to appoint a, an observer um, to the board of directors of any EDFM brokerage company. Clause 15 gives ANZ the right to audit EDFM brokerage companies. And 15.3 is the information undertaking in which uh, EDFM is obliged to provide copies of uh, various financial documentation and the like to ANZ with regard to the conduct of the EDFM brokerage business. Now, my lords, that, that was all I proposed to run through on that. But as, as we've said, it, it is a complex document. My, my learned friend says, oh, well, just because it's a complex document doesn't mean that it's an independent um, document that you shouldn't take into account as a, something in mitigation. Well, I mean, with respect, the complexity of the document is something your lordship should take into account because it is indicative, we would say, of something that is independent of and outside of the, the loss that we are seeking to recover from the fraudsters in this case. This is um, <coughs> along the lines of the Mobile case that your lordship adverted to yesterday it's essentially a reformulation of the relations between <coughs> MCM and ANZ and their respective parent companies setting out the terms on which both parties are going to pursue litigation and recoveries to make good their losses and it carries with it risks on both sides, but the character of the transaction, as the learned judge below found, is such as to be, we say, an independently negotiated contract, which is not something that is necessitated by the fraud in this case. And it went well beyond the settlement of a transaction giving rise to MCM's losses. <coughs> now, my Lord, I wasn't, unless you would like me to do so, proposing to take you to the Mobile North Sea case. Because, um, well, we've all looked, we've all looked at it, and um, I take it both of you have. Right? I've got the impression that your lordship has. So there's not going to be anything I can add to that other than to indicate. No, that's fine. Um, I wonder if you could just give me one moment. I have a raft of notes here that I perhaps ought to just look at before, because I, I, for my yes, own purposes, right. I've come to the end of my submission. So if you just bear with me a moment. All right. You kindly provided us last night with the bundle of sample contracts. Um, 
there may be nothing you need to say about those. We've, we've looked at them. If there's anything particular in there that you want to draw our attention to, then um, this is an opportunity to I, do so. I wasn't proposing to. Right, that's I fine. Mean, so, so no, that's fine. To anything that Mr. Lewis may make out of them or, or want to make certain, then maybe I can reserve my position. But I wasn't proposing to add anything to. No, that's fine. The judgment is sufficient for me where his lordship deals with uh, the various contractual relationships. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Nine short points following the sequence of my learned friend's submission. Point one, as to the argument that notice should have been given of the new point at trial, we say that is wrong and unfair in light of MCM's redactions. A, the redactions were always unjustified in light of clause 18. Point two C, and my learned friend could not justify them yesterday when asked to do so. They made it impossible to construe the settlement agreement as a whole. B, an unredacted version was requested on the 10th of September 2021, over a month before the first day of trial, that's supplemental tab 15, but not provided until the 9th. October. C. The case in Strait's trial skeleton at paragraph 143, shown to you yesterday, was that because of the redactions, MCM had failed to prove any loss. That was a broad submission that left open all avenues of inquiry when the redacted agreement was made available. So we don't accept that there was any concession in the skeleton as compared to the written closing and oral closing. Point two. As to my learned friend's argument that EDFM undertaking the payment obligation to buy MCM's release from liability to ANZ was a gift, we say three things. A, that misses the point. The relevant benefit to be taken into account is the release from liability of MCM to ANZ. B, in light of that release, if MCM wished to establish a loss, then it would be required to show a liability to its parent. They had pleaded that, in the particular claim, paragraph 69.1. The suggestion it was a gift is contrary to that requirement, and indeed that pleading. C, in any event, it cannot be assumed without more to have been a gift by EDFM to its subsidiary in circumstances where EDFM itself has various other rights and obligations and may benefit insofar as its subsidiary is no longer the target of ANZ's claim. Point three. My learned friend has very fairly confirmed that MCM were content at trial for commercial reasons that if the judge rejected their case that the ANZ matters were raised in Jello Sacta, and that's the contracts, the receipts, and the settlement agreement, um, they were content to fall back on the delta, i.e. that the judge should proceed on the basis of the calculations in my Annex 4. He says MCM would have done differently if we'd taken the new point. But if the outcome of this appeal is that the new point is not open to straight, then we are now as we were at trial. I do then say that the absence of a respondent's notice under CPR 52C paragraph 8.3 precludes my learned friend 
for this court from saying that the judge was right <coughs> to give the $284 million answer, but for wholly different reasons, i.e. that the settlement agreement is to be taken into account and when interpreted as a whole, leads one anyway to the figure of 284 million. So if the new point, my new point, is not in play on what I call part two, then under part one, and my existing grounds of appeal, the court should just choose from the menu of two options either for the reasons given by the judge or for the reasons we give. And for the reasons we give, should use the Annex 4 calculation. On this, my third point still, I do just want to hand <coughs> up please the copy of the settlement agreement as it was um, before the judge and until last Friday, as far as we were aware. My lend friend knows from last night I proposed to do this. Thank you. This is also marked Thank you. with confidential pagination. Indeed, it was already prepared because until Friday it was the version that we had proposed to bring to court. And um, the, the critical difference which is reflected in the debate on the transcript mentioned yesterday, one sees at confidential page 38 of this document. The maturity date was, as far as the judge and we were aware, until Friday, defined as the date falling 24 months from the refinancing effective date, or if the bridge, no, bridge RCF and bridge notes are repaid and redeemed and cancelled in full on or prior to the termination date, or the maturity date, 36 months from the refinancing effective date. And one turns, please, then to page 41 to see the refinancing effective date and that is to be given the meaning given to that term in the scheme the bottom of the same page the scheme which means the scheme or arrangement proposed by MTM pursuant to part 26 of the Companies Act 2006 we didn't know and still don't know who MTM are for the purposes of refinancing certain its existing liabilities and sanctioned by the High Court of Justice on or around Wednesday 9th September 2020. MTM is EDNF Man Treasury Management PLC. It says MTM. Is it? Oh yes. Yes, MTM. Yes. Um, and so um, what we say is history is repeating itself because we went into the last significant hearing on this case, having received only on the Saturday before opening the unredacted version. And now we came into this hearing, having received on Friday night at 4.14pm the version that has the maturity date in, around which my learned friend has now developed submissions this morning. Um, so you didn't know the maturity date because you didn't see the scheme, but you did know the scheme wasn't sanctioned. September 2020, and the maturity date would be at least 24, and in some circumstances it would be 36 months after that. So you did know that at trial, the maturity date had not yet arrived. Um, well, yes, that analysis can follow, but again, what one is doing is consistent with what my learned friend is doing this morning, allowing a new case to be run by MCM. And, and not just because it's Christmas, I, I do have to refer to Thorst and Goose and Gander here, but because it, we have my learned friend on the other hand saying there's no question of us running a new case by reference 
for this agreement um, for the reasons he's given. Um, and I do say that um, it's not appropriate for that case to be developed the first time, day two of the appeal. It doesn't feature anywhere in the Skelton argument, of course. Um, and this is all a function of the unjustified redaction. The reasons these things aren't, haven't come out before is because MCM has always played these cards close to its chest, trying instead to focus upon its primary case. Uh, and what we do say is it, it must take um, <coughs> the negative consequences of that as they follow. And my learned friend has very properly accepted that the, the Delta case was in play at trial on our part. This is not the parent case. Part one, the Delta case. It accepted that was in play, it was pleaded by other defendants, and therefore no pleading point was taken against us, and accepted that he never ran this analysis um, because the settlement agreement was highly complex. And now he wants to do differently, and that's where we say respondents' notice was the appropriate and only appropriate measure. I Point appreciate the. Um Irritation about a moving target uh, and uh, that um, this, was not, this was not taken at trial and there is no response to notice. But if we look at the um, if we look at the point, is it one that depends on the true meaning of the settlement agreement and doesn't raise other points which might have been gone into in trial, or, or not? And if so, uh, if, if the latter, then uh, what, what points would have arisen at trial and which points have been taken then? Well, what we say is that um, if the point had been taken at trial, it would have been necessary to uh, look at any number of other documents that are referred to in the settlement agreement, whichever version one is using, and if as my learning friend had to accept when he couldn't fully adopt a point from the bench this morning, there was no evidence, there was no evidence surrounding the circumstances of this settlement agreement. And for example, the question of whether there are benefits here to EDFM that accrue from the um, less conventional aspect of this agreement, um, and therefore can properly be said to be unrelated benefits, uh, benefits that are unrelated to the fraud, and therefore indicia that help move the agreement as a whole out of the camp of a, a compromise that is um, a benefit or an agreement caused by the fraud, and into the camp of an entirely independent reorganisation of a wider relationship between the ANZ group and an EDFM group. And we do say that one, one can't answer that question safely by reference simply to the four corners of the agreement. That is, and this is, again, this is on a point that was in play at trial, that is something on which if MCM wanted to advance the case, they should have done so by reference to evidence and explaining the wider context of this agreement and justifying beyond the four corners of the agreement itself why it was more than compromise. Now, I, I may leave, leave, that one leave, can leave aside that point. Is it compromise or no? Uh, it, sorry, is it, is, it, is it a collateral? Or is it a... a, a um, is it raising to raise Elio's act or collateral, or is it not? Leave aside that point. Your case your entire appeal here, this settled, releases the liability that AMZ has against MCM. And that's both on the original appeal and on the new point. So do we not have to read <coughs> the agreement and work out whether it does do that? Okay. On your case, leave aside any respondent's notice. Yes. We have got to be satisfied that it does release the liabilities and bring it down at least to the delta figure on your original case or down to nothing on your new case. 
Or I accept that, and we say... And, and to do that, do we not have to construe the whole document to understand how it operates? Um, one has to uh, find a release, for my case, and one finds that release. It is subject to potential conditions subsequent, so I'm going to come on to this in a moment. And we say that in order to um, remove the effect of the release, one would effectively need evidence, and this was one of the exchanges earlier, as to the, the likelihood of one of those conditions. Well, that's, that's the conditionality point. That's 3.2. That's the I conditionality think. point. But, but over and beyond that, do we not have to look at the entirety of the obligations on all the parties on the, in the settlement agreement to work out whether it does affect a, a simple release by ANZ of its 291 million headline claim against MCM? Because that's your case, and we have to be satisfied well, it does that. Um, you say you say it does. Look at clause three point one. Well, but 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 it may be, but it's not as simple as that. That's another way of allowing my learned friend to run his new point. Because my case is that there is a compromise here, and it's reduced the liability to the figure we're not mentioning. And what my learned friend contested below was that. It was a relevant matter. Yes, and I say, if you have got as far in my favour as finding it to be a relevant matter, that is the end of the appeal. And the appeal on part one is decided in my favour. Um, and what I, I don't accept is that, given the procedural history of this matter, I need to go further, i.e. I, I need to push beyond where I pushed below, because below I didn't get any pushback as against my Annex 4 calculation. Um, my point four, um, based on <coughs> Malone Friend's submissions on Swinson and Allianz, we say it is effectively common ground that the issue on part one, as I've called it, is one of proximate causation. I say that common ground flows from the points made by Malone and Friend in reliance on Allianz, if we can look at that, please, briefly. So we have that in Authorities Bundle, tab 15. And if one could turn, please, to page 355. Under the heading collateral benefit as an answer to avoided loss, Lord Justice Phillips refers to British Westinghouse, then to Swinson, then to the Sainsbury's and Mastercard case, That's starting at 33. And over the page on 357, cites the, the two paragraphs I showed your Lordships yesterday, 197 on avoiding double recovery, 215 on legal causation. Before then saying, at paragraph 35, that legal causation and collateral benefit are the two alternatives. That is because collateral benefit arises when the test, that test of legal causation, is not satisfied. And this common ground was therefore further reflected by my learned friend saying that the fraud was only the occasion for the ANZ contracts and receipts. That is the language that refutes legal causation. It amounts in substance to an assertion that but for causation is established, but not legal or proximate causation. Point five. Once it's established that the legal test is one of proximate causation, it then becomes a fact-sensitive inquiry. Three sub points. A, 
Little is then gained from comparison with the facts of other ca cases, e.g. Swinton or Allianz. Although I do say, if necessary, that the relationship between the two sets of contracts here, through which the forgeries passed back to back, is very much closer than that between the claim for breach of statutory duty in Allianz and the investment contracts between the funds and their investors. B, what we don't accept is that there is some bright line subtest on proximate causation, which says if there are separate contracts in a string, then benefits under one cannot be received as a result of the other. One cannot simply say the character of the benefit is that it was received under a separate contract, and that ends the analysis because anything else rides roughshod. C, that would be a much simpler rule just to ask whether the benefits were received under a different legal contract. But that is not the rule here. Proximate causation is not hard edged in that way. Point six the test of proximate causation does come with Lord Sumption's guidelines on classic cases of collateral benefit. My learned friend relied upon that phrase from Swinson to say here the receipts from A and Z were a benefit received by right from a third party in respect of the loss but for which the claimant has given a consideration independent of the legal relationship with the defendant from which the loss arose. While that applies to insurance and disability pensions, it cannot apply to the A and Z receipts. There are three problems with my friend's case on that. Problem one, the benefit was not received as of right by MCM because it had no right to be paid by ANZ for forgeries. Point, problem two, to invoke this category, my learned friend actually has to concede that the ANZ receipts were in respect of the loss. Problem three, MCM did not give consideration to ANZ, and certainly not independent consideration to ANZ. It only provided forgeries. Well, your, your case is that at the time the transactions were entered into, MCM paid out 284, received in 291, and therefore <coughs> it hadn't made up, but it had a liability, potential liability to ANZ. Is it not a simpler way of looking at the position as at the transaction date to say MCM paid out 284? And although it did receive 291, it was under an immediate liability to pay it back. It didn't know it. ANZ didn't know it. But in fact, it didn't benefit from the receipt of that 291 at all because it had a corresponding liability to pay back the same, same money. Yeah. MCM make a similar point in their skeleton, and they say that the, the two aspects of that relating to ANZ are self-cancelling, leaving <coughs> one only with the MCM. Um, I, I, that is one way of analysing the matter, but we say it's not the appropriate way when one is applying the principles of Lord Brown, Wilkinson and Swinson for all the reasons I've given. And ultimately it's the choice the court has to make. One can choose to say those are self-cancelling and one is therefore effectively excluding from consideration any ANZ related matter. Or one can say that in fact because of the, the closeness of the different aspects of the overall um, deal, I won't use the word transaction, um, it, it's not appropriate just to allow those two to self counsel and instead what self counsel are the, um, the 284 million majority of the 291 receipts from 
ANZ, which is then passed on as 284 million only to uh, Come Harvest Megawell. And in the end, when one puts those three aspects together, um, the, the choice as to which aspects cancel each other out and where one is left um, it isn't obvious from just looking at those parts of the equation. Therefore, one has to engage in this wider proximate causation inquiry for the reasons I've given. Uh, and that's where we say MCM don't really have an answer because all they can say is separate principle to principle contract. They don't have an answer for the matters in paragraph 19 and 20 of our skeleton that we looked at yesterday, which we say uh, are taken together uh, decisive. My point seven of nine, um, this is on the contract documents that um, MCM and Pineco very helpfully provided last night. Uh, I, I do say uh, two things about them. A, they reinforce the account I gave yesterday of the formation and operation of the contract by reference to the judgment and Mr. Riley's witness statement. Uh, the PMAs and the warehouse receipts which were itemised on the PMA letter, were all dated the 22nd of June, as will have been seen, while the sale and purchase contracts were all dated the 30th of June. Um, as such, the sale and purchase contracts are not for specific goods, but uh, as you will have seen, they are for very precise quantities, which tally exactly with the aggregate gross tonnages of the warehouse receipts. Um, I can make that good. If one turns, please, for example, to tab four, the ANZ contract, which is in a single page document, one sees the quantity is 702.758 metric tons under second line of clause 4 mm -hmm. and if one then turns to tab 7 one has the three warehouse receipts that were itemised in the PMA letter in the middle of each of those warehouse receipts is a line quantity at the end of each of those well, it's the final figure sorry it's the net tonnage um, NTWT so the figure on the first receipt for example behind tab 7 is 180.0250 and if one aggregates the three weights across the warehouse receipts, one gets to the figure in the contract. And what that demonstrates is that although these weren't contracts for the sale of specific goods as such, it was in the clear contemplation of the parties that the documents which were being provided, as Mr. Riley said, by email in advance of going firm, were then what was contemplated to be provided in hard copy uh, once the contract has been concluded. But the contract doesn't, does it, actually identify the particular warehouse receipts? No, and that's why I accept it is not strictly a contract for sale of specific goods. So you could technically perform the contract by producing other warehouse receipts? Well, in practice, it's extraordinarily unlikely that you would get that, but, but as a matter of contract, you could. Well, that must be right. One would have to go to another qualifying warehouse and get them to um, provide or segregate exactly 702.768 yes. metric tons from scratch, yep. rather than using the already segregated quantities in the warehouse. Although, if that's the case, what's the point of sending the warehouse receipt and PMA letter before the deal is concluded? think that if you send the MCM send those documents to ANZ saying in effect 
fancy these. Um, you know, those are the ones they are committing to supply. Well, formal contract doesn't say that. Um, well, this is um, the point I mentioned yesterday, that um, there's no express term in here suggesting that it's a contract for the sale of specific goods, but there was a wider relationship here, and there was something that's referred to in the judgment, in paragraphs 80 and 334, as the same paper in, same paper out rule. And this was actually at the heart of the fraud, because uh, as your lordships will have seen, um, both the master agreement uh, permit the, um, the lending party to uh, return on the second leg what's referred to as either substitute or equivalent metal. Yes. And that would have created a problem for the fraudsters because that would have enabled, for example, ANZ to pass the warehouse receipt to someone else or indeed go to the warehouse and get a fresh warehouse receipt reissued, which could have brought down the whole package. House of Cards. So instead, there was an arrangement um, which was covered extensively in Mr. Riley's evidence, where there was the same paper in, paper, paper out principle, and that's paragraph 80 of the judgment, such that on the return leg, ANZ to MCM and then MCM to come harvest mega wealth wouldn't return substitute or equivalent metal, but instead would return the warehouse receipt ensuring um, that the forgeries didn't circulate first. Well, it, av it avoids the holder, the endorsee, going and getting a receipt in their own name, which, as you say, would have brought, exposed the fraud. Was that principle, the same paper in the same paper out, not only communicated and accepted by MCM, but communicated and accepted by ANZ? Uh, yes, although um, the judgment isn't as explicit on that as it might be. It, this is, it's covered at paragraphs 80 and 334, but there was, um, there was extensive evidence on MCM approaching lots of other lenders saying, we want to do this business, can we get finance from you as well? And then when they explained the same paper in, same paper out principle, being told that the lenders weren't interested. Um, but it doesn't find its way into the judgment. The, the, the latter point doesn't. I mean, it all um, perhaps comes back, though, to paragraph 69.1 of the particulars of claim, where the allegation was that the defendants knew MCM would enter into the subcontract with ANZ. And, and we went through the findings yesterday about that being the contemplation. It's while on the warehouse receipts interest, even if not directly relevant to today's purposes. The, um, the, the, the endorsements are provided, so the back page. And um, what one can therefore see is that this is a copy of a forgery that you have in your bundles now. Because, for example, on the back page of the warehouse receipt appearing first behind tab 7, we see in box 1 the endorsement of Straits Singapore PTE Limited and a signature. Twenty second of June 2016. And, and they were the forgeries, or they were an aspect of the document as a whole being forged. So that was not the signature of anyone at Straits. That was not Straits chop, it was instead a fake. And then, of course, one has the endorsement by Megawealth International, followed by an endorsement by MCM. But that's to put those documents in context. My point eight. Um, in light of your Lordship's reference yesterday to the Mobile and PJ Pipe case. I wish to draw your attention also to the decision in Durley House and Firmdale Hotels. I, again, I told my learned friend about this last night. If I may, please hand up the. <coughs> Mr. Stephen 
Morris QC sitting as a deputy, as he then was. And Ferndale Hotels had agreed to cover Dudley's, Durley's rent on a Sloan Avenue property. Ferndale was held liable under that agreement, but before the judgment order, it became apparent that Durley had settled with the landlord and had not itself paid the rent. The judge held that on its true construction, the settlement had not discharged Durley of its liability to the landlord. But if he was wrong about that, Distinguishing Mobile and PJ Pipe would have held that the settlement was an act of mitigation avoiding the loss. So the key passage on which we would rely is at paragraph 69 to 71. judge asked whether the settlement agreement was an act in mitigation or raised in Torellius Acta, and in particular at 71, said he accepted that just as in mobile the settlement in the present case is not between the same parties, but I do not understand that for Justice Dricks was laying down a rule that the mitigating transaction must necessarily be between the same parties as those who are parties to the contract and subject to the claim. Had I found that the settlement agreement had fully released the claimant from liability to the lessor, then I would have accepted the defendant's submission and held that, whilst the settlement in mobile did not affect the clause rights against PJ Pipe, in the present case, by contrast, the settlement agreement did affect the claimant's rights against the defendant and take away the loss that underpinned the claimant's rights against the defendant. In particular, as well, at paragraphs 47 to, to 51, the, the judge has summarised uh, the mobile and PJ Pipe, um, which, as we've just seen, he goes on to distinguish. And he um, focuses on Lord Justice Rick's three critical hurdles, and we say here equally that they can be distinguished. Hurdle one, um, MCM's claim is not merely for an indemnity, But we do say if we succeed on part one, so if all the trades are a composite transaction, then MCM's claim, properly framed, should be for an indemnity for its liability to ANZ. As to critical hurdle two from Mobile, um, in, in neither Mobile nor Durley was there a complete discharge of the claimant's liability to the third party. Here we say, absent any evidence as to the probability of the condition subsequent, there is, by way of clause three, effectively a mutual release and discharge. Critical hurdle three is as to the reformulation of the relationship. Here we say, that the case is closer to Durley than Mobile. The settlement was an act of mitigation, reducing or even extinguishing for MCM any liability to ANZ. Um, that flows from its inextricable connection with the prior liability to ANZ. And we do say that where at part one, the claimant's loss is its liability to a third party, there should at least be a rebuttable presumption that a compromise of that liability is taken into account to quantify, reduce, or avoid that loss. The settlement agreement is complex, but we say as a whole it does arise as a result of the fraud. One reads the recitals which explain its genesis. They are all about ANZ's 
claim on MCM, compromises that claim, and then various aspects of security that are being provided in favour of ANZ because ANZ isn't getting any money from the outset. So we do say in the absence of any evidence on all these points or otherwise, the settlement agreement should be treated as uh, a benefit to be taken into account. <coughs> point nine, final point, um, on Smith New Court this morning. Malenikin's narrow reading of the word transaction in Lord Brown Wilkinson's principles, uh, as if interpreting them as a contract, cannot work in particular because of principle six. Lord Brown Wilkinson says, in addition, the plaintiff is entitled to recover <coughs> consequential losses caused by the transaction. On my learned friend's strict interpretation, where the fraud was only the occasion for the MCM ANZ contract, losses thereunder could not have been caused by the transaction. So one has to read Lord Brown Wilkinson's principles as a whole, <coughs> and one, when doing so, give that phrase transaction a, a purposive meaning. Unless there are any questions. <coughs> Can I just ask about your characterization of clause 3.2 as a condition subsequent? Uh, I'm looking at the Confidential A, page 6, obviously, the most recent settlement agreement. Yes. The, the structure is that the release in 3.1a is with effect from the date of the agreement. Yes. And then 3.2a says that in the event EDFM is subject to the event of default, then the release shall be revoked. The events of default in relation at least to the warranties in 17.1b relate to warranties which are given as to the, the situation as at the date of agreement and either are or aren't broken as at the date of agreement, although it may only be later that is apparent and it looks as though the event of default in 17.1b Rises at the moment that the warranty is broken. So that wouldn't be a condition subsequent to it. It would simply be a. Uh, there wouldn't. It's conditional, and um, conditional on a state of affairs that may or may not exist. Yes. Well, uh, that's right, and it's pointed out. Well, it's pointed out to me from behind that, of course, there can be a reinstatement of the release. But um, w whether the the phrase "condition subsequent" is is apt to <coughs> summarise what's happening here or not, the release is complete, subject to it being revocable, and that then becomes, as I said, an evidentiary not question. Revocable, revoked. Which may, which may take place contemporaneously with the grant of the release. That's the point I'm putting to you. Well, we, it, it may relate back um, on a, an interpretation of when the breach of warranty occurs, but um, well, it's when the it then becomes a Yes, which is itself when the breach of warranty occurs. But the trial judge, and, and if this new point is open, this court has to decide whether there has or has not been a release. And the answer is there has been a release um, because there's no evidence to the contrary that there was any breach of warranty. And my own friend said it's something we, we it would never happen. So on that basis, um, we say this point doesn't affect the debate. 
when one is asking as a matter of principle, is the document raised in Jonas Acta? Um, yes, one may have to define its character as a whole, but what one can't do is allow the exception to obliterate the rule. The, 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 the starting point and the overwhelmingly probable outcome here is a release. And that release compromises the liability, which, if I'm right, up to this point, is the measure of loss. And that's why we say one should look at it effectively in terms of rebuttable presumption. <coughs> that the settlement is a compromise of the liability which we're using to assess the loss. Um, and I do say that it puts an evidentiary burden on the other side to come and say, well, actually, it's not a release for these reasons. Now, the fact that there might be contingencies where the release is qualified could, if they were drastic and probable, affect its status as a benefit, collateral or not. But where there's no suggestion <coughs> that they're improbable, it shouldn't do so. Can I ask you a different question? Which is, Durley has, if I, if I understood it correctly, you have a tenant who has a liability to a landlord. Quantified liability has actually got a judgment against him. You have someone who is liable to indemnify the tenant. And the tenant and the landlord enter into an agreement, the effect of which is that the landlord, on the face of it, releases the tenant in return for handing over the net proceeds that it recovers from the litigation against the indemnifier. And what the judge says is, well, there's a circularity there, because if you start with the release, there isn't any liability, so there aren't any net proceeds. That's obvious nonsense. The intention of, of this is that you get the net proceeds you hand it over and then you get your release, even though it's not what it actually looks like on its face. You have to break the circularity because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. It, is that not similar, not dissimilar to our case? Well, before we get to our case, um, the judge does talk about the circularity, but I, I wouldn't accept that on its face the contract does anything differently because the words of the contract that are emphasised in paragraph 41 <laughs> are that um, under clause 4.2, Five there, the release is on payment in full as provided in clause 4.1. And so the judges identified those words um, as a, a prelude to finding as a matter of construction actually that there's no release at all until payment. So um, the a timing, is not it's before. It's a timing them. point. It's a timing point. And that's why the point on which I've relied is effectively over here, because the judge didn't need to get to that stage because there was no release and based on the second critical hurdle from Mobo he said well, that that's a good enough answer um, but he was finding that there was no release at all because of the chronology that flowed on a proper construction of the settlement agreement in that case and, and what it shows is that each case will turn upon the terms of the particular settlement as to here uh, we don't accept that the situation is the same because we do say that there has been a release. There's no evidence that the release has been um, qualified or even or obliterated in any way by the, the matters that could lead to it being revoked. And um, therefore, one then asks to what extent the compromise has affected the, the liability. And you have but it's not, a, it's not a complete release. It's not as if MCM has no liability under the settlement agreement. MCM, leave aside the parents' payment what? obligation, MCM has an obligation to pursue recoveries and hand them over. So it's not a, it's not a complete release. It's, it's substituting for a claim to recover the 291 by way of restitution or breach of contract, a mechanism under which MCM will to you, among other people, and hand over the proceeds. Um, uh, it, it's um, <coughs> not a complete release so that MCM can walk away and wash its hands of the matter. I accept that. But that isn't determinative as to the result that flows from the agreement. And on that, you have my submissions on um, what MCM's case was below. Well, I have that, I have that point. 
But insofar as we're looking at this and we look at the whole agreement, if, the, if it simply said, in return for the parent paying the Delta figure, we release MCN, then I see your argument that that's a diminution in the total loss that MCN has suffered. But that's, that's, that's far too simplistic an, an analysis of what it actually is intended to do and appears to do. But if it said instead, for example, um, in return for releasing MCM, MCM must do A and B, and A and B themselves have a cost, then the quantification of the loss would be A and B. A and B. Or, and if, they, if there's a payment to be made to A and Z to buy the release on top of agreeing to do A and B, it would be payment plus A and B. Okay, thank you. So I take it that um, you've done a Westlaw or equivalent search on mobile oil, and this is the only case that came up. We have. It's not the only one, but it is the only one that we, we felt would be of assistance. Yep. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much. And there's, I think you're entitled to a reply on that case. <coughs> well, to. my lords, in, in light of my own friend's comment that, well, each case depends upon its own facts. Uh, I wasn't actually going to say anything further on the Shirley House because each case does depend on its own set of terms and the facts that are relevant to that. So we can all read what it says, but it doesn't really take us much further. All right. Well, thank that's you all much. I was going to say. No, that's fine. Right. Uh, well, in that case, we will reserve our judgments. Uh, they will be sent to you in draft they're ready uh, to the individual email addresses which you have provided. Um, I'm sure you're well aware, but I'll say it anyway, that they will be sent to you subject to an embargo which is taken very seriously. You all know about the Council General for Wales cases case and the consequences which may follow if the embargo is not honoured. Meanwhile, thank you. Um, both and uh, those sitting behind you for some uh, very interesting arguments which